Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for meeting us, Lord, on so many different levels and so many different parts of our lives, so many different aspects of our lives, Lord. I ask, Father, that you would help us to, uh, to be sensitive of your Holy Spirit and what you're trying to do in our lives. Father, it, you, we've said it over and over. We have as much of you as we want. Father, I ask that you would stoke up a desire, a hunger, and a thirst for more and more of those times with you where we recognize you in the moment. We do love you. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in, in John chapter 1, 39 and 40, he says, And he said unto them, Come and see. Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. And it was about the 10th hour or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who, had, who heard John spake and followed uh, Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, we talked about this a little bit last week about how he came and he saw and he remained with Jesus. Uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he came to see where he was actually living. Okay, Matthew 11, we just looked at the verse a couple of seconds ago. Uh, verse 28 through 30 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is an invitation to you and I today. What, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, okay? The, the culture of the day was sun up to sundown. Sundown, everything stopped. You were in your house, okay? Unless you were of ill report. You were a thief. You were a prostitute. You were a scumbag looking for a prostitute. Whatever. It was not... You, oh, you could have been a, 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 on guard duty or something like that. Some good, good stuff too. But, but us, basically, families, sundown, we're in a house, we're with our families for the rest of the, rest of the day, rest of the evening. Okay? So it's 4 o'clock. It's getting close to that time. Jesus is doing more than saying, hey, you need a place to shack up for the night? Come with me. This is very, very different. When a... When somebody was going, when somebody wanted to attach themselves to a teacher, okay, they would actually, the, the big time teacher, they would actually go and live with them, okay? Now, Laura, if Wilson started bringing home his students to live with you guys, that would probably be kind of rough. But back then it was common because they only took on a couple of students usually. It was usually a smaller group, Okay, they would teach a broad number of people, but their actual disciples were the ones that came and lived with them. So Jesus is saying, come and see where I stay. Come. They were asking, Lord, where do you, where do you dwell? Because we want to we be your disciples. They were hungering for it. Jesus said, come and see. He accepted them and then extended to them the invitation. This was a huge, huge thing. And this changed everything for Andrew. Okay, they came and they abode with Jesus. They stayed by his side uh, in his presence and, and they became something, something different. Okay, uh, I, I go back to John chapter 1 verse 12 all the time because of the invitation God gives to us. As many as received unto them, gave you the power to become the sons or the children of God, uh, even to them that believe on his name. These are for Okay, we, we've, we've done this before. Um, we've done this before where, where the Christian walk over the years has been very, very watered down. Um, not by everybody, not by every church, not by every believer, not by uh, every country, but there's a, there's a kind of a overly casual way about being a disciple. Back in this day, look what he did. He actually went and stayed with them. These guys lived with Jesus for three and a half years. They separated from their jobs, they separated from everything, and they went and they three and a half years with them. Now, I'm not saying all of you go home, quit your jobs, and uh, let's go out into the wilderness. And I'm not saying that. However, I think we've gone way too far the other way. I think that there's an almost casual, hey, did you read your Bible? Yes. Nah, nah, I didn't get to it yesterday. I was kind of busy, but I'll, I'll get to it tomorrow. 
When people come in for counseling, I, those are the questions. I ask them two questions. Have you been on your knees and have you been in the book? Those are the first two questions I ask when somebody comes to me for, whether it's premarital counseling, uh, uh, teen counseling, uh, any kind of, I say, have you been on your knees and have you been in the book? Well, you know, life's gotten kind of busy and, okay, now I know, I know what we're working with here. I know where to start. There's a problem. There's a disconnect from the power source. Uh, Andrew said, I'm, I'm going to go and be with you. So, so take a look here at the question. What is God looking for from those who come to him? Now, that, kind of, that, that question, if you, if you give it a chance and let it seek in, uh, uh, seep into your, your brain and your heart, will blow your mind. And I'll tell you why. Usually, when people come to God, it's to get something. But the question here is, what's God looking for? What does God want? Uh, there was a, um, I, I'd heard a, uh, um, and, and it happened to me once too, but it was, it was a little bit more intense for this other preacher. Uh, a, a woman called the church and said, uh, hi, I'm, think, I'm looking for church, I'm looking for a church to attend. I'm, I'm shopping around, she said. And the preacher said, oh, okay. She said, what do you have to offer me at your church? He said, well, I don't know. What do you have to offer the church? She said, no, no, I'm, I, I don't think you understand. I'm looking for a church to attend. And I'm just wondering, what, do you, what, do you, what programs do you have for me there? He said, no, no, I don't misunderstand what you're saying at all. What I want to know is, what do you bring into the church? What do you have to give God? She said, I'm sorry, did I get the right? Is this a church? <laughs> but the concept of me, 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 feed me, give me, is, and, and commercialism, well, let me see. Okay, this church wants to give me that. It's, it's like, like uh, you know, the, the NFL draft, <laughs> you know? What, what, can, what have you done for me lately? No. What is, what's God looking for? So this is the question for you guys. What do you think God is looking for in a disciple? Help me out with that. Obedience. Number one, obedience. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Now people will say, oh, so what? God just wants a bunch of, uh, a bunch of yes men, a bunch of slaves. But he wants obedience. Obedience was the very, we start out with worship tonight. Obedience was the very first form of worship. What did he tell Adam and Eve? I've given you everything. Just don't eat from that tree. It was a command. It was an act of obedience. That was an act of worship. Obedience. What else is he looking for from a, a disciple? Surrender. Obedience and surrender. Uh, um, can you obey without surrendering? You, you, can, you can put on a good show. You can put on a good show. There's a, there's a, there's a, a true surrender where you're, you're doing it for the right reason. And then there's a, just kind of the obedience of doing it because you have to. So there is, there, is, there is some difference there. I would, you know, some people say, well, yeah, but true obedience comes from a truly surrendered heart. And I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But are, are church pews filled with people just going through the motions in this country? I think so. I think so. What's another mark of a, uh, uh, a disciple, a follower of Christ? Love for others. What did Jesus say? Love one another as I have loved you. A new commandment I've given you. Love one another as I have loved you. Absolutely. One of the litmus tests to know if you're right with God is, do you have a true love for others, including the unlovely? It's easy to love, it's easy to love the people in this room. I'll be honest with you. I have no problem with that. Somebody came in here and said, do you love these people? Pfft, put me on a lie detector test, test. Piece of cake. But there are some people in my life that if they asked me, and I said that, the lie detector would go, brah, brah, you know, would go all over the place. And I have to check myself. Oh, wait a minute. I need, to, I, 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 need, I need to really be careful about that. I need to love. Did Christ only love the lovely? Did Christ love anybody that was lovely? There was no lovely people. <laughs> so everybody that he loved was unlovely. So he wants to do the same. So, so we, have, we have obedience, we have surrender, we have love. Those are the big three. And there are a multitude of other things that he's looking for. 
devotion, dedication. Uh, um, um, he, he wants us to be discipling and being discipling. There's, there's so much. There's so much. But we have to keep in mind, it's not just us getting from God. It's us saying, Lord, what do you want? You ever get on your knees to pray and say, Lord, forget about me. What do you want today? What do you want? What can I give back to you? Not in order to barter, not in order to kind of to say, okay, God, you give me all this, so let me try to equal out the scale. You're never going to get that scale to even budge. But coming from a heart that truly is passionately in love with God will say, Lord, what do you want? You ever ask God how he's doing? Every now and then I wake up in the morning. I, I, every morning I get out of bed, I get on my knees, and, and, I, and, I, and I pray. And uh, every once in a while I get out of bed, I get on my knees, and I say, good morning, Lord, how are you doing today? As if he woke up, right? <laughs> I know that he didn't, but, but I, I want to have a real relationship with God. I want to, I want to, so I, Lord, how are you doing today? And then the answer comes back, not well, because my children are hurting. And I say, okay, well, I guess I, guess I got some work to do today. <laughs> what can I do? How can I help? What can I do for you, Lord? How can I hurt, soften you? How can, how can I ease your heart? Even a drop. How can I bring a smile to your face today? It should be some of the things that we should be thinking about if we're truly disciples of him. I think a lot of times people think that the discipleship goes the other way around and God is just kind of here to serve us. But a disciple became a servant to the teacher and would actually serve, cook his meals, uh, clean his clothing in his home, sweep it. That, that's what the disciple would do. That's what we're called to do. We're called to, Lord, what do you want from me? Isaiah, use me, send me. Here I am, use me. John the Baptist, uh, Andrew here, uh, use me. Okay, so look what he does. Okay, so, so here's this, this guy. He hears about Christ. Uh, he hears Christ speak. He goes to him, wants to become his disciple. Christ gives him the invitation. Look at the first thing he does. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted to Christ. Andrew's first concern was for who? Who was his first concern for? His brother. His brother. Now think about this. Uh, uh, Andrew got it instantly. He's like, this is the Messiah. We got that here. But rather than try to get something for himself, rather than trying to say, okay, hey, I'm in good. I found the Messiah. I'm, I'm set up. He ran and he, and he got his brother. The first thing he did was witness. Andrew had met Jesus personally, and Jesus met the core need of his heart, which was salvation. And Andrew could not contain the peace and the joy. He just had to go and tell somebody he loved. He couldn't contain himself. It reminds me of Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Uh, then I said, I will not make mention of him, meaning God, or speak any more in his name. So, so let's stop there for a second. Let me give you some background. Jeremiah is burnt out. He is toasted at this point. Nobody's listening to him. He's been persecuted. His words are bouncing off of deaf ears. He's done. So done, he says, I quit. I quit the prophet business. I'm going to go do something else. I don't want to be a prophet. I'm not even going to make mention of God anymore. But then look what happens. But... His word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said it was, the fire of God's word was so passionate inside of him that he was actually tired and exhausted keeping it in, not sharing it. And it just had to come out. <laughs> That's incredible. So here's my question. Is God's word lighting you up? Does the, his desire for lost people, uh, lost people, does that burn with, inside of you? Does that which breaks the heart of God, does it break your heart as well? How, how on, now, in order to, in, in order to, to have this kind of fire about God's word, 
what do you have to be doing? In order for God's word to be on fire inside of you, what do you have to be doing? Reading, Reading it. <laughs> You've got to be in it. It's got to be in you, right? Um, do you think reading through the Bible one time in your life is going to be enough? If you're like me, definitely not. I mean, if you have some kind of a crazy, wacky, photographic memory for words, um, God bless you. <laughs> I've noticed every time I open up this book, I see something new. You ever notice that? Right? So, now let, let's, let's, let's get painfully real. How many of you would say, yeah, when I open up this book, something new jumps out? Outstanding. That was the fun part. How many of you would say, you had, in the last three years, let's, let's make it really painful. In the last three years, have you missed full days of being in God's word? No. Do you realize, and my hand went up too, and I'm a pastor for crying out loud. Do you realize how ludicrous that is for us? I mean, imagine eating the best meal you could possibly eat. And the, the chef says to you, if you come every day, I'll make, I'll make you the best meal every day. How many of us would ever miss a meal? We'd be like, what time is it? Uh, stop everything. I got to go get my food because he's cooking up something special for me today. Right? Am I right? We would not miss a meal. Why? Because it's so good for us. Yet, this book, we open it and it's, and it's the words of life and we say, wow, I didn't catch that before. I didn't catch that the first 900 times I read it. Why does it do that? Anybody know why this book, the, how many of you have ever read, um, how many of you have ever read a book more than once other than the Bible? Okay. Did everything jump out at you like that? How does, why does this book do that? Anybody know? It's alive. And it wants us to be alive. Well, not it wants us, but God wants us to be alive in it. So, so what we should we do? People ask me all the time, Pastor, how, how much should I read a day? How much, you know, wish I, and I tell them the same thing. Anybody, anybody know what my answer is? You guys have heard this so many times. Anybody know what my answer is? Read it until something grabs a hold of you and doesn't let you go. I don't care if it's a verse. I don't care if it's 80 chapters. Whatever it takes, read until it grabs you and will not let you go. That's the power of God's word. So let's take a look here. What, what, what happens next? In verse 41, he first finds his brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, interpreted the Christ. This was his motivation. Had it been just an ordinary person, that would have not lit him up this way. But he found the Messiah. Let me give you a little word study here. Uh, Messiah and Christ, they're the same word. They mean the same thing, okay? The word Christ comes from the word Christos, okay? It's a Greek word. Uh, the word Messiah is a Hebrew word, okay? And it refers to, basically what it means is the anointed one. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title describing who he is. He's the anointed of God, okay? And, but what it does point to is it points to the three offices that Christ occupies. Anybody know what the three offices that, God, that Christ occupied while he was here on this earth? And now. Anybody remember? I'll give you the first one. Prophet. What else? Priest and king. Prophet, priest, and king. Okay, and we're going we're gonna, to, that's what the anointed one points to. It's not one of the anointed, it's the anointed one. And that's huge. Are you one of the anointed? As a child of God, absolutely. You're anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? But this was something different. This was the anointed one. Even though we've been anointed by God, we're not messiahs. Uh, we are children of God, but, but take a look. This is what, uh, let's take a look. He fills the office of prophet. In Deuteronomy 
chapter 18. It's actually verses 15 through 19, but I got the first verse here. Uh, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Some people will say that, well, this is all the prophets that ever came. No, this is very, very singular in nature. This is not plural in nature. This is not all the prophets from Moses all the way through Malachi. This is the prophet. This is the Christ. Okay, he occupied the office of a prophet. What's a prophet? Anybody know what a prophet is? Someone who proclaims the word of God. Okay? Either foretelling or forthtelling is a, who, so who, who can occupy the office of a prophet today? A teacher or a preacher of God's word. Okay? It's either foretelling or forthtelling. Foretelling was what the prophets did in Old Testament and, and Christ did. Forthtelling is giving God's word, preaching God's word. That's what a prophet did. Also, he occupied the office of a priest. Psalm 110.4 says this, uh, uh, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now there's a name for you. You want a Bible name for your next child? There's one for you. Melchizedek. Call him Mel for short. All right? We're going to be talking about Melchizedek probably midway through the book. Okay? Melchizedek, uh, uh, incredibly unique figure in Old Testament times. But his priesthood superseded that of Levi. We find that out in, 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 um, in Hebrews. So it was the top priesthood. And Christ occupied that. There was only one. It wasn't like a bunch of priests. It was Christ. Christ occupied the office of priest for us. Now, what's, what's a priest do? Biblically speaking, Old Testament time, New Testament time. What's a priest's main goal? Has to do with the sacrifices. Has to do with administering that which uh, um, um, eliminates sin or, or covers sin. Or it, it's that a priest was the, was the, the person that kind of uh, uh, made the road straight between God the Father and them. And that's what Christ did on the cross. Okay? So he occupied the, the office. He also occupied the office of a, of a king. 2 Samuel 7, uh, 12 and 13 says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Stop there. Up until that point, we have no idea who he's talking about. Without that last word, we really don't know. Without that last word, it could be Solomon. It could be Rehoboam. Right? Forever. The only one that can occupy the throne forever is Christ. He is the king, our king. And in Revelation, we, hear, we find out that he's not just a king. He's the king of all kings. Uh, we read in the scripture where every knee will bow, the great and the small. Kings will bow down before God, before Christ, as he sits on his throne one day kings. When you think of a king, you think, wow, you know, they will be bowing down just like everybody else, the great and the small kings, uh, paupers, uh, 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 the big shots, the little shots, the, everybody will be bowing down before the one true God. <laughs> what a sight is that that's going to be. So this is, the, uh, this is what, that, what it means by Messiah, by uh, Christos, the Christ the anointed one. He fulfills the uh, office of prophet, priest, and king. So when you hear Christ, you can, you can kind of get in your mind, okay, the, it's pointing to, he's the anointed one who fulfills these three offices. If you hear Messiah, he's the anointed one. Messiah is Hebrew. Uh, uh, Christ is Greek. Same word, meaning the same thing. He occupies the, the office of prophet, priest, and king. Okay? All right, take a look at verse 42. Uh, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, important word there. If you like to mark in your Bible, mark, underline or circle that word beheld. 
And Jesus beheld him and said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpreted a stone. We're going to look at Peter's names and what, how they, what they mean much later on. But this is the, the fruit of Andrew's uh, um, uh, witnessing. But take a look. I, I, want to, I, I point out this word beheld because it's a, it's a powerful word. It means to look upon with, intense, uh, with an intensity. Uh, it's an earnest look, to concentrate, to stare, to gaze upon. Uh, it's to look through the outside into the inside. Jesus looks, beholds Peter. Not just kind of a glance. You ever meet somebody <coughs> and you get their name and, and like literally two seconds later you forget their name? You ever, we've all been there, correct? We hate it, don't we? We despise it because we think, we know we should be more uh, um, uh, sensitive than that. Jesus beheld. I wonder what that look was like. I wonder what it felt like to be in Peter's shoes as God looks right through him. What did that gaze, what did, that, what did those eyes look like as God looked at his very heart? What an incredible thing. Thou shalt be called uh, refers to the future. Simon's name would be changed to Cephas. Uh, uh, and and, and we're gonna, like I said, we're going we're gonna to get into that. Did Peter become a rock right away? Peter, Peter was more like clay, more like Simon. The name Simon means clay, soft clay. He was more like, kind of like that. Uh, he was fiery, but uh, had trouble backing it up. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt misunderstood before? All right? Totally, completely, all the time, right? If you're a teenager, you feel it all the time. If you're married, you feel it all the time, right? You feel misunderstood. And, and yeah, of course, how many of you have ever sent a text or an email and the person responded the complete opposite of what you expected? I hate communicating through email. Text and email. Most of you, when you when you text me or email me, I usually call you instead. Hey, you know, <laughs> right? Because I'm not smart enough to make my words sound like what I'm really trying to get across, and we end up being misunderstood. There is one that will never, ever misunderstand, and that is Christ, because He looks deep into our heart. Jesus saw what in Him? What did Jesus see in Him? Did Jesus see just as bad, or did He see just the bad stuff, or did He see something good? Potential. He saw his potential. Take a look at this. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Why? Because when God looks at you, he doesn't just see the mess up that you've made of your life. He doesn't just see all your mistakes. When I was growing up, I grew up in a, in a, uh, a church that that's all they said. They said, everything you do wrong, God's writing down and, and he's going to zap you in the end for it. I was like, ugh. Oh. Boy, am I in trouble, All right? But God sees your potential. He sees what you can become, what he can make you uh, into. It's incredible. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He is not done with you. He can do so much more with you.